As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we begin with this statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community, inclusive of all our differences, with native peoples at the core of our efforts. Tonight, live from the Spurlock Museum of World Cultures at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He's the man armed with data at the big board, the man who also single-handedly brought khaki pants back into style. He just spent days counting votes in the race for Speaker of the House. After a wild and unexpected turn of events in the 2022 midterm elections, Steve started out as a print reporter before becoming, we should say, a reluctant TV star. But he never forgot how to write. He's the author of The Red and the Blue, The 1990s and the Birth of Political Tribalism. He's also the host of the new podcast, The Revolution. But it's not just politics. He has taken his talents to the world of sports as well, from NBC's Football Night in America to the Olympic Games and the Kentucky Derby. His talents are innumerable. His enthusiasm is unparalleled. I have known golden retrievers less enthusiastic than my friend Steve. And tonight, Steve Kornacki becomes an honorary member of the Fighting Illini. An event brought to you by the Richard and Leslie Frank Center for Leadership and Innovation in Media. Your moderator tonight is the Frank Center Director and Clinical Assistant Professor of Journalism she also happens to be former executive producer of The 11th Hour with Brian Williams, and that's Colleen King. And as the disjointed voice of Brian Williams, let me say, Colleen was my wingwoman and Steve was my wingman for countless election nights in a place called Cable News in the faraway land of Midtown Manhattan. So please welcome my friends, Colleen King, and your guest of honor, Steve Kornacki. Steve Karnacki, welcome. I was overwhelmed. <laughs> Steve didn't know that was coming until a few minutes ago. Nor did he know about the Golden Retriever line. Uh, it's, uh... That was Brian. That was Brian. Well, welcome to the University of Illinois. Thank you. Um, you have been talking to students all day today. Um, and you told a story I would love for you to tell this audience and our webinar viewers. Um, about the first thing you did, the first place you went out of college when you graduated from Boston University. What did you do? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, thanks to everybody for, for coming out for this. Uh, appreciate it and uh, really excited to be here. Um, first thing I did uh, when I graduated BU uh, was I, I didn't have a, a real great plan. Uh, I was a film television major um, and I had a couple friends who wanted to be screenwriters uh, in, in Hollywood, so they were going to go to LA, and I didn't have a job lined up, so I said, well, I'll go with you. Um, always wanted to drive across the country, as we, you know, we did, we drove Boston to, to LA. Um, and I said, yeah, I'll stay a, a month or so, and I don't know, maybe, maybe something will, maybe I'll like it, and I'll stay, I had no plan, like I said. So uh, I got out there, and um, I was like, you know, if I'm going to stay for a little while, I need some money. Um, how can I get some money in LA? And it occurred to me, I was like, you know, all those, uh, all those game shows are uh, taped out here. So I, uh, I spent my time in LA trying, I thought if I could just get on one and win, <laughs> you know, what's that, 20 grand? I'm set for a while. So I went to, I auditioned for every game show I could find out there. Uh, it, it failed, believe it or not. <laughs> I thought I was on one show, it got canceled. Uh, 
What and, were the shows um, you tried out for as I, kind I, of a throwback? Yeah, this, yeah I got to be of a certain age, I guess, to, to if you remember any of these. But there was the one that I got the closest to was called Win Ben Stein's Money. Okay, there is some. <laughs> um, that's the one that got canceled. Um, and uh, they were doing Family Feud. I don't know who the host was at that point. They've had like 12 different hosts of that show. But I was with my two friends, and we were living in, um, it was a Days Inn in Glendale, California, an extended stay. You get a monthly rate at the Days Inn. So we were staying there, and there was a lady who ran their booking office. So I tried to get us all qualified as a family for the Family Feud. <laughs> that didn't work out. Uh, and there were a couple others, but uh, unfortunately never made it as a game show contestant and uh, came, back, uh, came back east and then got a real job. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me what that real job was. What'd you do? Um, it was, I, I got a job. I'm from Massachusetts originally. Uh, as I said, somebody else is. Well, that's great. Um, <laughs> and um, I went to school in Boston. I, and the first job I got, though, was very randomly covering politics in New Jersey. Um, state politics for a website. This was, again, this is almost, this was 20 years ago, and um, it was a novelty. The idea of a non, print journalism, you know, you're writing, you know, but it's online only. There's no print products. There's no newspaper. There's no magazine. It's an online site. This was an absolute novel concept. When I told people this was my job, they, they you know, like, what do you do to get actual money? Um, <laughs> but it was a great experience. I didn't know much about New Jersey, New Jersey politics. So there for three and a half years, I learned a ton about journalism, about politics, about the state. I met some of the most unforgettable characters. Um, I always tell people my favorite stories when, when people ask for stories from my career or whatever, they all come from New Jersey. Um, and, yeah, I, see, I'm, I'm in Illinois and I've told people this today too. I'm like, I, I've, I've thought about this through the years. You know, some states politically are just more interesting than others. <laughs> Illinois is an interesting state politically. New Jersey is an interesting state politically. You know, Rhode Island, Louisiana, those are, you know, Utah, pff, you know. You're lucky. I know it comes with a lot of corruption and probably wasted money, but it, it can be fun, too, to be, in a, to be in an interesting state. That's what I learned in New Jersey. So talk about how you went from covering politics and print to eventually getting on TV. Um, well, it actually, I, it, 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 I got my first television opportunity in New Jersey, and it was, um, you know, I was writing for this website, you know, just covering state politics, and there was a um, uh, sort of a state, the CNN or MSNBC of New Jersey, 24-hour cable news channel covered New Jersey only, called News 12 New Jersey. Um, the joke was it was named after the number of people who watched it, but that was... <laughs> Um, but they had a weekend um, political show, and um, the, the guy that hosted it, um, you know, was a former report. He'd, he'd worn a number of different hats. He, I, I sort of, he'd sort of be the, the Tim Russert of, of, uh, um, uh, of New Jersey. Well, actually, I, I, I think he was, I say this in a, in a totally uh, affectionate way. He was a Chris Matthews. Like, Personality-wise, he, was, he yeah. was very similar to Chris Matthews. When I started going on the air with Chris Matthews, I, I was, it was like, wow, I've had this experience before. Uh, yeah. it's like, um, but he was the host, and he wanted to have sort of a sidekick, and he brought me on, and um, so I did that. It was a weekly you know, show um, covering New Jersey State politics. So I, I, I kind of got a little taste of it and felt like, okay, this is something I'd be comfortable doing. I wasn't getting paid. It wasn't a full-time job, but that was my first exposure. Um, ended up going from New Jersey to covering Congress, for Roll Call, which is a, uh, you know, a very inside Capitol Hill publication. Um, came back uh, from DC to cover, um, to work for the New York Observer, uh, which was at the time a weekly print newspaper online as well. But um, it, I came back, my friend had become the political editor there, and uh, we, the paper was being sold, and we believed that the new owner was gonna be Robert De Niro. Um, he owned the Tribeca Film Festival in New York, and it, it was ended like, up it, it. yeah. And then at the last minute, somebody swooped in and outbid him, and it was Jared Kushner, um, <laughs> who had just graduated from Harvard, and whose whose father's um, indictment by Chris Christie I had covered in New Jersey. <laughs> Lurid indictment. Um, it sounds I, like they know what happened. Yeah, I can't. I, I mean, good, because right. I don't want to repeat the details in <laughs> mixed company. Uh, it was uh, so. Um, it was. Um, um, it was very awkward, um, and uh, th there was a deal, I think, with the, the, the fellow who sold the Observer to Jared that, that, that the editor, as long as the editor was in place, you know, Jared couldn't make any big editorial changes. At some point, the editor left, 
Then the big editorial changes began, um, including getting rid of me. So uh, I, I had the privilege of being fired, not directly by Jared, but under Jared's, uh, Jared's <laughs> regime. Um, and um, uh, it start, but started, it was, it was at the Observer, actually, that um, I remember I was there when um, Elliot Spitzer was the governor of New York, and there was a scandal with Elliot Spitzer, and he was forced out. Um, and that was when, the, the first time I got in cable news, mm -hmm. um, because they wanted New York-based you know, political writers to come on and talk about it. So um, I was on MS, I was on CNN around that time, I think that was 2008, and um, ended up at an online website, Salon, as the politics editor, uh, after I left The Observer, MS started using me. Um, and at some point, MS um, made me a contributor. And then uh, MSNBC. MSNBC, yep. yep. And then in summer of 2012, they launched a uh, afternoon panel show for people <laughs> called The Cycle. Um, so they put me on that. That was the first time I had sort of a full-time television, uh, television gig. And yeah. there you go. So you evolved from talk show co-host into a political data guy. How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's one of these things where it's like I've always been interested in, I've always loved election nights, always, as far back as I can remember. I think it's what got me interested. I got interested in politics at a young age, and I think it was, it was watching the spectacle of election night that, that did it. You know, talking about being like 10, 11 years old, couldn't tell you what the issues were, couldn't, you know, um, couldn't tell you you know, why one candidate might be better than the other, but I just remember watching election night and really being taken in by kind of, just interesting to watch the different patterns emerge on the map and why was this and to watch the score change. And I was always into sports too and I loved like, you know, reading the box scores and, and you know, following the standings and that sort of thing. So I think there's always been sort of a natural interest kind of in numbers and, and data. Um, and then there was an interest in politics that was kind of, you know, sparked at a young age that I always, uh, so I always had that. Um, and then sometime in, you know, I, the, the first network that, that did a, one of those interactive boards on election night, I think it was CNN, I think it was in 2006. So the technology at these networks was evolving in terms of how they presented election night. And I just remember seeing that CNN one when they did it the first time and being like, well, I'd love to, I'd love to, to do that. And I got to MS, when I got there, um, you know, it was done on MS by Chuck Todd. Yeah. And then in 2014, a couple months before the election, Chuck Todd got named the host of Meet the Press. Um, and so my boss called me up and just said, hey, you know, Chuck's not gonna be available on election nights anymore. We need somebody else to, to do the board. You know, would you be interested? And I was like, yeah. I was hoping to hear those words. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So how do you um, talk about the process, which is months, if not years long, of getting ready for a big election? Um, yeah, it's, it really is kind of a never-ending process now. Um, I, I, with every election, I become more and more aware of what I don't know about any particular state, whether it's you know, the, the, the geography of a state, sort of the, the political geography of the state. The, um, or you know, now a major issue is, um, just for what I do, a major issue is um, there's been just this kind of explosion in different methods of voting, right? You know, it used to be 20 years ago, it was almost automatic. You, you went on election day to your local polling place, you voted, and that was it. Now, mail voting, early, all these different forms of voting, and they produce very wildly different results. You know, mail-in ballots almost always are over, it's in the last couple of years, this is a, there's a big Trump effect in this, are, are, are now hugely Democratic. You know, mm -hmm. three to one, four to one, maybe even more. Um, the, uh, the same day voting, in a lot of states, the same day voting, the, the old fashioned one I'm talking about that used to be standard, is now much more Republican just in terms of the, the concentration of that vote. Um, and, and then the early in person is a, a mix of the two. So it's critical on election night that I know when any given state is coming in, what am I looking at? You know, if 33% of the vote is in, in, uh, you know, in Georgia, and the Democrat is ahead by two points, well, that means if it's all mail-in votes, that's terrible news for the Democrat. You know, if it's, if it's same-day vote, that's great news for the Democrat. You see, you need, you need to know what you're looking at, what's left, and every, some states have, a very, have this very, you know, automatic in terms of what the process is. Other states, it's just every county decides for itself. And so one of the things that we do in the run-up to these elections is we just 
We call, there are 3,143 counties across the country. We don't call them all, but we call significant counties and significant states, and we ask to talk to the election administrators uh, and to just basically say, hey, can you, can you walk us through how, what your process is on election night? Do they ever ask if you're really Steve Kornacki? <laughs> um, they, a lot of them I don't think the name means anything to, which is fine by me. I just, I say NBC, you know, some of them, some of them have seen me and watched me. It, it, it's interesting because you get, um, you, it's, it, you get a real interesting taste of what's out there in terms of who has these jobs, these election, these major election administration jobs. There are some people who have them, you get them on the phone and you could tell they love it. You know, they eat this stuff for lunch. It's like, they, they just want to tell you every detail. And it's, I'm just like, I'll take notes, talk, go, 20 minutes, and I get everything I need to know. Yeah. And then you get the others who I get the sense are much more like, you know, they're, they're political, no other way to say it, they're like political hacks. Yeah. They're kind of in a job, I don't think they're passionate about it, and they, you know, they don't really want to have a great conversation. And I, I don't think they fully, they don't spend their days and nights thinking about it. You know, you get that like impression. Yeah, and, and so those are the ones I'm trying to draw the information out and I'm not confident I'm getting the, the right information, I'm getting what I can. And then there's the others that just that just don't talk to the press and that that's, won't take the call, won't return the call and that's that's its own problem. So, um, but we try as best we can to um, you know talk to these folks before election night and then also like I try to have contact information, text basically, to text or email where on election night I can get in touch with them if we're waiting on a certain county um, or we have a question about a certain county, I, you know, again, they're doing a million things. Sometimes the, I'm lucky enough, they'll write back right away and give me an explanation and I can use it on the air. But that's, this is all, when I started doing this in 2014, as recently as 2014, I didn't really have to think about all the things I'm, I'm saying to you right now. Yeah. But a decade later, the way voting has changed, you do. Okay, so I wanna know, what do you eat for breakfast on election day? <laughs> <laughs> Um, pretty much nothing. Uh, I, I, I always remember, um, as I said, I'm from Massachusetts. Red Auerbach used to coach the Boston Celtics way back. And Red Auerbach, I, I, always, I learned this about him and, and it always stuck with me. Uh, he would never eat uh, on a game day until after the game because he said he, he thought it took his edge away. Uh, it, 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 it made him angry, it made him hungry, like literally and figuratively, to, to not have eaten before a game. And I kind of take that same approach to election nights, where you know, if, I, if I'm eating during the day, I'm going to have a little less energy and I'm gonna slow down, and, I, and so I, I, I will, I'll have coffee, and that's, that's about it. <laughs> um, so take me through election day before you're on air, and then when you go on air around six, seven Eastern. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, it's changed because, you know, what, what the, the, my new expectation is that it's, it's not going to just be election night. It's going to be election week and maybe more. You know, it was eight days this year between election day and when we actually called control of the House. And it was longer than that until every race was actually called. So How much could, did you sleep that week? Very, very little. <laughs> um, because the problem with, from my standpoint, the, the issue I have to contend with with the, this new reality, because, again, a lot of state, this explosion in different Voting methods, some states are, um, and counties, are very well positioned to, to deal with it and can get it all tabulated and released. Florida gets, gets it all done basically by 11, 11.30 on election night. I mean, it's a pretty gigantic state. Um, they're the most efficient vote counting state. Other states, um, first of all, haven't been doing this as long as Florida's been doing it. So they just, a lot of them introduced it because of COVID um, and don't have the infrastructure in place or the experience to get this tabulated quickly, and so you're waiting, you know, you're waiting days. California is the slowest state in the country for getting its votes um, tabulated. Um, we were, um, it can really take a month to get every congressional race in California called. And why so, is that? So, um, officially they will, so this is where I, I, I you know, um, I, I think there's room to have an, a, a, a fair-minded debate about you know what's what's reasonable in terms of um, vote by mail what's reasonable in terms of deadlines ballots can come in in California in, by mail after election day um, that's one thing um, is it is it reasonable to say a mail-in ballot needs to be received by election night or by you know 
election day itself, the same day that everybody else is, the deadline to vote in person, should that be the same deadline? If you're getting a ballot 45 days before an election, is it reasonable to say you got 45 days to turn it in? Um, but you know, in California, the ballots are coming in long after uh, election night, and they turn them around, some counties turn them around very, very slowly on top of that, and I don't, I don't exactly know why. Um, Another issue that pops up in Arizona, which is a very slow counting state late and is, is unlike California, is almost always competitive at the statewide level. So the issue you have in Arizona, the technical issue is that, and this one drives me nuts because I think there's a solution to this. Um, if, you if you have a vote by mail ballot in Arizona, you can go drop it off on election day and you can go drop it off anywhere. And what that does is it creates this pile of hundreds of thousands of ballots that they then need to spend the next week validating, checking you know, the voter's identity. It, it, it's a very bureaucratic process. If the rule in Arizona was that same person, okay, you, you had a mail-in ballot, you didn't mail it in, now you're gonna, one way or another, you're gonna drive to a polling location. You're either gonna drive to a polling location and you're gonna drop off your mail-in ballot and it's gonna trigger this days-long bureaucratic process, or you drive to a polling location and you get a ballot and you vote in person. And I, and I think if that was, the, that's the rule in a lot of other states. If that were the rule in Arizona, I think Arizona elections would be called much earlier than they are. That's a huge reason for the delay there. Um, so I, 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 think there, I think there are discussions that can and should, should happen. We've had this, big shift towards different voting methods, longer voting windows. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think it's in the interest of um, the country, frankly, to think a little bit about uh, sort of a clear, a clear and efficient vote counting process that's, that makes sense to the average voter who's watching this. Because um, I, think, I, I think when these counts go on for days or for weeks, it, I can end up giving a technical explanation on the air, but I think it, 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 it kind of, it puts an undue burden on the average voter to, to expect them to understand that when I think there are reasonable measures that can be taken to, to just get a clean, transparent, efficient result faster. It sounds like the beginning of a New York Times op-ed. I've, th <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about it. I've, 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 not, not, not New York, I thought about pitching segments to MS about, about um, comparing certain counties, and, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, well I wanna ask you about 24, uh, 2024, but I think before we do that, you should tell us where we stand following the 2022 midterms, and you've got a big board here to take us through some here data. Here we go. Let's just take, like at work. Let's take a look. And just like at work, I'm gonna find out right away if this thing feels like cooperating or not, because <laughs> the one at, at, at uh, 30 Rock doesn't always. But yeah, basically, um, a, a look here at the 2022 midterm and, and the climate that it's kind of created here and the questions it's created heading into 2024. I thought I'd share a couple of slides, a couple of things here. Um, look at that right away, I got it. There it is, I got it. I figured this one out, it only took me two. Okay, so. Um, this is from the exit poll on election day. Uh, Joe Biden presidential approval rating was 44%. His disapproval rating, mid 50s. Why was there so much talk in the run up to 2022 that it was gonna be a red wave? Republicans were gonna win dozens of House seats. Republicans were gonna get the Senate, no problem. Um, this is a big reason. Historically, this has been a terrible number uh, for a president to have taken into a midterm. Uh, this is a number basically identical to what Donald Trump took into 2018. Republicans took it on the chin. This is a number that's basically identical to where Barack Obama was in 2010. Democrats lost 63 seats. Uh, this is a number that looks like Bill Clinton's number in 1994, the Republican Revolution year. So Joe Biden's approval rating looked like just where Republicans needed it to be to have a big wave. Then if you looked at attitudes about the economy, the state of the economy, three quarters of voters, again, telling the exit polls, pollsters on election day, the economy was not in a good place. Again, this, is this with a poor presidential approval rating has typically meant a windfall for the opposition party because the opposition party is typically just a, in a midterm election, typically functions for a certain type of voter, the swing voter, as the protest vehicle. If you don't like the party that has the White House, especially if that party also has the House and has the Senate, has full control, if you've got a gripe on this, 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 or that, you use the opposition party to send a protest. And that's typically what's, what we've seen in these midterm elections. So right there, that's why expectations were so low for Democrats 
for uh, uh, the entire year leading up to election night. So what was different? Why did Democrats end up having a pretty good midterm election? One they certainly feel good about, one that Republicans, certainly when you talk to them, don't tend to feel so good about. Here's the difference that we saw, that we saw and this is again from the exit polls, what you're looking at here are independent voters. And so that phenomenon I'm describing of the swing voters typically going for the opposition party when the incumbent president isn't popular, in every one of these previous midterms, 06, 10, 14, 18, the incumbent president had an approval rating that was about where Biden's was in 2022, or in the case of Bush in 06, even worse. But all four of these previous presidents had lousy midterms in the years you're seeing here. And in all four of the cases, look, with Trump, independents went for Democrats by 12 points. With Obama, he, they went for Republicans by 12 and by 19. With Bush, they went for Democrats by 18. The independent voters went for the opposition party by double-digit landslide margins. Look at this. In 2022, the independent vote actually went for the Democrats by two points. So the president's got a lousy approval rating. People think the economy is not doing well at all. And the swing voters, the independent voters, actually voted for the incumbent party, the White House party, by two points. That's a total departure from everything we've seen. And I, we, this list could go back much farther, but that's a total departure from what we've come to expect in midterm elections. So why? Why was it? I think this next graphic sums it up as well as anything else. This is, again, from the exit poll here, specifically looking at independent voters, the voters who've sided for Democrats by two points. Ask them about their attitudes towards the Democratic Party. They, didn't, they don't like the Democratic Party. 53%, a majority of independents, had a negative view of the Democratic Party. 60%, this isn't the job approval, this is just their, their, their assessment of Joe Biden when you give his name. 60% had a negative reaction to Joe Biden's name. Again, you could, you could add these numbers to those ones I showed you at the start. These are numbers that suggest a landslide for the opposition party. Here's the difference. It's the Republican Party, even less popular significantly, 10 points less popular than the Democratic Party. Look at that, a favorable rating of barely 30%. And then it's Donald Trump, a former president, and typically the former president has been pretty invisible in midterm elections. Well, an unusually visible, prominent, polarizing former president. You think about it, you know, what was the news uh, in the run-up to the 2022 midterms? Among other things, there was the raid of Mar-a-Lago, over the summer that had Trump front and center. There was Trump literally the weekend before the election teeing up the possibility of, and now the reality of, another run for the presidency in 2024. Donald Trump, you think back to 2010, 2010 midterm, when Barack Obama was president, his first midterm election, he had come into office replacing George W. Bush who left the presidency with an approval rating below 30%. And what did George W. Bush do for the next two years? Absolutely nothing. He stayed perfectly quiet. He went back to Texas, and he stayed perfectly quiet, and the Republican Party moved on from him. And the Republican Party was then able to take advantage of Obama's low approval rating and the terrible state of the economy in 2010. Well, Donald Trump did the opposite of what George W. Bush did, and so Donald Trump became, I believe, a central figure in the 2020 election. And attitudes about Trump and attitudes about the Republican Party, I think among independent voters, as much as they didn't like Biden and the Democrats in the state of the economy, the message they delivered was they had even more concerns about Republicans and about Donald Trump. And as a result, by that two-point margin, they sided with Democrats. One other question that I think just jumped out in this uh, uh, exit poll, it was this, because this gets to Trump, this gets to how he left office. This gets to January 6th. And again, remember over the summer, leading up to the election, you had those primetime January 6th hearings that I think really did. I was, I myself was wondering politically, were they gonna have any effect? I look at the uh, uh, midterm results, I look at the exit polls, I think they did have an effect of recentering the issue. Um, you ask this question of independence in the exit poll, do you think that democracy in the United States is secure or is it threatened? And you see seven in 10 say that it's threatened. So a, a huge number of independent voters believe that democracy is threatened. And what was the split in terms of how they voted? Well, the ones who, the independent voters who thought it was secure voted for Republicans by a pretty solid margin. Those who felt it was threatened, and there were a lot more of them, 
voted for Democrats by a 16-point margin. And again, I think that's totally related to January 6th, to attitudes about Donald Trump, to attitudes about the Republican Party and its relationship with Donald Trump among independent voters. So it wasn't a ringing endorsement of Democratic policies or the Biden presidency that independents were expressing on election day, but it more, I think, was a level of concern about January 6th, about the Republican Party, and about Donald Trump. And it's, we have not seen a, moder a modern midterm election where a former president has you know, played that central of a role. We've not seen a modern midterm election. The, the, the White House party always says, and I've seen this election after election, they always go to a midterm, and it's looking rough for them, and, and they say, that all the, the, the president's team will say, we're gonna nationalize the election and we're gonna make it a referendum uh, uh, between the two parties. And it's, they never do. It's always just about the president and the president always takes it on the chin. That's what we're used to seeing. The Democrats succeeded this, this year, or last year I should say, in making this a choice between the two parties. And they, by a slim margin there, the independents sided with the Democrats and it created you know, a situation where we can go through this here, um, where the Democrats nearly held the House. Uh, I say this was not a ringing endorsement of the Democrats because the, the, the problem that this raises for Republicans and the question that this raises for Republicans heading into 2024 is obvious. If Donald Trump in January 6th were a drag on them in 2022, and I think there's no question that was the case, is that going to be, is Donald Trump, is it going to affect Donald Trump's ability to win the nomination again in 2024? And if he is nominated again in 2024, is it going to compromise his ability to win back uh, uh, his job? Or will he in some way or will events in some way over the next two years change attitude towards Trump? Will January 6th fading two more years into the past? Will they change attitudes among independents towards Trump and produce, produce a different result? But 2022 certainly, I think, is a warning sign potentially to Republicans that if you nominate Trump again, you may meet some resistance even if voters aren't happy with Biden's performance um, in, in, in the presidency. The flip side is, even though Democrats had a more successful than they expected midterm, there are still warning signs to them. Like I said, Joe Biden is not a popular president. The party itself is not popular with voters. And this other issue that's kind of arisen for Democrats in the last half decade or so, non-white voters, particularly Hispanic and Asian American voters, have been moving away from the Democratic Party. So in 2022, Hispanics voted for Democrats by 21 points. Asian Americans voted for Democrats by 18 points. What did it look like in 2018, the last midterm election? Look at the difference. The Hispanic vote was 40 points for Democrats in 2018. The Asian American vote, 54 points for Democrats in 2018. This shift started in the 2020 election. We saw a big change of those two groups towards the Republicans and continued in the 2022 election. And the Hispanic share of the electorate and the Asian American share of the electorate is rising with every, ele with every election. So that is a, there's a concern there for Democrats Longer term, uh, longer term, it could be a concern for them in 2024. So as I say, I mean, they, they walked away very happy from this election, um, but there are, underneath the surface, they've got their own, I think, warning signs to deal with. Very quickly, Democrats failed to hold on to the House, but I think the thing that's got to kill them is they could have. They came very, very close, and I think this is the other warning sign for them. I don't know if this is expandable, it's not, okay. Um, it's small geographically, but there are, I'm looking at New York State here. This is Long Island. These are two, okay, I didn't expect that to work. <laughs> I thought that wasn't gonna do anything. There are two districts on Long Island that you see here. These are the Democratic held seats that Republicans won, okay? Um, there are two on Long Island. One of those is the George Santos district, which you know all about, okay? This one right here, the bigger one uh, right there, that is, that is the district that was held by the chairman of the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Sean Patrick Maloney. He lo lost his own seat for re-election. And then this is the, four, so Republicans won four Democratic held seats in New York. And there's another district around Syracuse that was represented by Republicans that Democrats believed they could flip and they failed to flip. So functionally, Democrats lost five seats out of New York State, and you can do the math. 
It's 222 to 213 right now for the Republicans. That's the balance of power in the House. If the Democrats had won those five seats in New York, it would be 218 to 217 for the Democrats. So New York, and what was the issue in New York State? This is where the, another one of these warning signs for Democrats. It did not happen nationally, but it happened in a few pockets of the country where issues in, in New York City, I think, around crime and quality of life. There's been an increase in crime. There's been all sorts of indicators about quality of life conditions deteriorating in parts of New York City. There were tons of stories in local news in New York about like people being pushed onto subway tracks, violent incidents that reminders of a different era in New York, covered extensively by local media, and it was not so much New York City itself, although there were pockets of New York City where you saw this, but it was politically competitive areas outside of New York City that respond. By the way, one of the big issues in New York State had been that the Democratic-controlled legislature had gotten rid of cash bail about a year earlier, about a year before the election, caused a pretty significant backlash in the state. I think that registered here as well. The Republican candidate for governor of New York lost, only lost by five points. He really, really ran on the crime issue, and that, he, he, all of these districts here, he won, and his, the, the Republican candidate for governor won. Um, so it, the Republicans thought that that was going to carry them in a lot of other places nationally. It didn't really. There were a few other places, though, where you saw it. One you can see is out here, outside of, where is this? Outside of Portland, Oregon. You know, crime quality of life has been a major issue in Portland, Oregon. Here's a district right outside of it where Democrats tossed out a moderate incumbent in a primary, replaced with a more liberal uh, Democrat, uh, tossed out a moderate Democrat in the primary, replaced with a liberal Democrat who then lost the seats to the Republicans in the fall. Republicans running on crime, quality of life, right outside Portland. You see no red gains in California, but what you, Democrats believed there was a seat here they could get in Los Angeles County. This cold cluster of districts you see right there, Democrats believed they were gonna pick up a seat there. The 27th district of California, it's entirely contained within Los Angeles County. It's represented by a Republican, Mike Garcia, who won by only 333 votes in 2020. Um, Garcia won by 12 points in 2022. What was the issue? The issue was crime. The issue was quality of life. And it's, you know, if you know LA County, it's big and it's sprawling. There's LA, there's the city of Los Angeles itself, but you can get pretty far away from the city of Los Angeles and still be in Los Angeles County. It's sort of like Long Island is to New York City, the 27th district is to LA County. Same, I think it's the same thing. The exact same thing you saw in Long Island, you saw it in the outskirts of Los Angeles County, and it kept Democrats from picking up a seat they believed they were going to pick up in Los Angeles County. So it, it's, there are warning signs there clear and obvious for Republicans because they underperformed in the midterm in a way we have not seen, under conditions we've not seen the opposition party underperform in the recent past. There is no modern precedent for the opposition party underperforming to the degree Republicans underperformed given the conditions that I, that I described here. That being said, so that raises obvious questions for them for 2024. That being said, between the issue of crime having some potency in some, clear potency in some pockets of the country um, and the issue of Democrats continuing now for two straight elections to lose significant support among pockets of non-white voters and the overall unpopularity of Joe Biden and the Democratic Party brand, there's issues for Democrats as well. So I, I just, I think it creates a very, um, um, it creates a very interesting 2023 because each party has to make some decisions based on what I'm describing here. One decision feels like it may already have been made, and that is the Democrats seem to have taken 2022 and, and, and seem to be content to rally around Biden. You don't see big name, I think if Democrats had lost 30, 40 seats, you might see some big name Democrats toying with, you know, challenging them. You're not seeing that right now. Um, so Democrats, it, for the moment, it seems like have answered the question of where they're gonna go in 24. Republicans, very much an open question. You know, how do Republican voters process what happened in 2022? How do they process it as they decide between Donald Trump and whether it's Ron DeSantis or any of the others who are looking at, or, or, or in Nikki Haley's case, actually announced candidacies? How do Republicans process it? How does that affect their strategic thinking for 2024? Um, that's what we're gonna find out in the coming months. So. And what does the polling show for the Republican field so far for 2024? It, it, it depends on the day and it depends on the poll. There are, I, you know, it, it is, if, you, if you've been following this stuff, you've probably noticed it. I mean, you can find polls that show Trump 
20 points ahead of DeSantis. You can find polls that show DeSantis breathing down you know, Trump's neck. So um, it, it, what they do show, though, is whatever poll you're looking at is, um, there's, this is, and this is a, a story in our national politics, there's an education divide we talk about all the time where um, it's particularly true it's particularly true among white voters, but it's now becoming a factor among non-white voters, and it accounts for a lot of that shift that I just showed you there. Um, voters with college degrees, white voters with college degrees, have become heavily, overwhelmingly democratic. Uh, white voters without college degrees have become heavily and overwhelmingly Republican. And this is almost a total reversal from where things were like 50 years ago, um, but that's where they are right now. So when you look inside the Republican Party and you look at that college divide, Trump is, uh, Trump DeSantis, do a Trump DeSantis head to head poll. Um, DeSantis will win the college educated portion of the Republican electorate, mm -hmm. and Trump will win big the non college portion. And so I, I, I tend to look at a potential Trump DeSantis matchup, and I, and I look at the Republican coalition, and I sort of think, um, boy, if, if you got to bet on one of those, the, the one that's growing is the non-college portion, mm -hmm. and that's the one that Trump is strongest in right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got to ask about the khakis. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like when your pants go viral? <laughs> Um, I still remember my uh, producer uh, during the election yeah. of 2020 uh, pulling me aside uh, during the day and saying, I, uh, what the kind of pants are you wearing? <laughs> I was like, why? what? <laughs> um, and he says, yeah, somebody, uh, uh, somebody from New York Magazine is, is asking. I was like, oh. So I answered it and didn't think anything of it and then and found out after. From the gap, I, I, I <laughs> this is not, I, I, I people have, I, I, I don't understand, I don't understand the, I mean, <laughs> I don't, I truly have, I truly don't understand it. I'm not complaining about it whatsoever, but like, I, it's not, I don't have, I think people have, for the, the people have, uh, there's an assumption that um, I, I, I love khakis and it's all I, <laughs> it's the only pants I had in the office that day. <laughs> This is the middle of COVID. Um, I, had, I had them on. There's no adults in the building. Everybody's at home. And I, I got to go on the air for the elections. I had the pants on. I just tuck in my shirt. I put on a tie and I go on the air. Yeah. And then, of course, it's the election. I'm not off the air for days, so I'm wearing the same stuff. I don't know. <laughs> and, and then it just became this thing. And I, I don't, yeah. <laughs> to, be, uh, to be fair, I think I've known you 10 or 12 years. I've only ever seen you wear khakis or jeans before. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't wear dress pants. They tried to a couple times. <laughs> a couple times, I remember the good folks at uh, at uh, MSNBC sent somebody out with me to to buy fancy yeah. clothes, and I they're too. It's, that's too much for me. So, um, <laughs> but I wouldn't be. Yeah, if you catch me off hours, I'm not wearing khakis. Right. So, okay, one more uncomfortable question. <laughs> um, what was it like when you heard you were on people's most sexiest men alive list? Uh, that I say, the who did real. You, who that, did that, you call or text? That first? was the that was the real voter fraud in in, <laughs> in 2020. Um, however, that was decided. No, that was. Uh, what do you do? Do you call your mom? What do you do? No, no? people people no. <laughs> people called me, and and I I tell you I I did. But my friends have given me more than enough grief to have made that worth it, so it was. <laughs> okay, was, <laughs> okay, let's talk about sports. <laughs> okay. Uh, after the 2020 election, you got approached by NBC Sports, and what were they looking for? Um, yeah, it, it just, it, it coincided mid-November with, um, you know, you're getting towards the later stage of the NFL season, uh, and they said, do you want to do um, sort of a, you do the road to 270 for, you know, uh, for the elections, do you want to do the road to the playoffs, the playoff chase? And, um, I said, geez, absolutely. I, I mean, I, Sunday Night Football, I watch it anyway. Um, it was a great opportunity. I was just, I was like, this is great. I, I just want to make sure, the one thing I said to them, and that we all agreed on, you know, I was like, I just, this, I don't want this to be, if you want to do this, I don't, I want it to be for real. You know, not a gimmick. Not like, oh, ha, 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 there's the khakis guys doing the football numbers now. You know, it's like, make it a meaningful, um, you know, part of the show. And I think we've done that. I think there's a natural overlap 
Um, like I said, when I do election coverage, it's all about scenarios, right? It's all about, hey, if Biden takes Georgia, Trump's got to get North Carolina and Ohio or, or whatever, you know what I mean? And that's what the playoff chase is in the NFL. It's, you know, hey, if the, if the Seahawks win this week, then the Rams have to lose, you know, it, it's, it, it, there's a lot of similarity there. And so, you know, we came up with, we have a data partner, um, a data, uh, a, a bunch of um, data analytics, um, you know, just pure um, football experts who we work with and, you know, just are running models all day on Sunday. And we have the luxury Sunday night football, football night in America comes on when most of the games for the day are over or ending. And so we can show you in that What's the set. day like leading up to that? It's, it's, a, it's such, such a fun experience. NBC Sports is based in Stamford, Connecticut. It's about 40 minutes outside New York City. Um, I go up there on Sundays uh, and get there a little bit before 1 o'clock Eastern, first kickoffs, and they've got their whole crew, the producers and the on-air folks, in a room um, with a screen for every game. And I, you watch the games, but somebody like me, I'm, I'm watching. With Tony Dungy. Yeah, I'm like, I'm watching Tony Dungy watch the game. Because that's like, what, are you kidding me? I get to watch a Hall of Fame coach yeah. watch a football game. And I get to see his unfiltered reactions. Um, and it's fascinating. And what they're doing, obviously, is you know, they got an hour, hour 20 or whatever in the pregame show. They're going to go through every game and do a highlight package and, and break down you know, key moments. So they're looking for um, you know, what are the moments that, that they want to highlight, what are the mistakes, what are the, um, and so it's interesting to see that kind of in real time, to see the reactions from, you know, from somebody like Tony Dungy, um, and then to see it, what it becomes on the air yeah. you know, later on. So I, it's a very cool experience. Um, I would like to get to some audience questions here, um, and Faith will get going on that in a second. But um, what do you think of the prospects for Illini basketball, men's and women's this year? <laughs> <laughs> got to see the um, got to see the facility today and uh, meet the coaches. What a wow! Um, well, I, I, so this is the first time in twenty years that both men's and women's are going to qualify like that, yeah. for the tournament. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you what. I, I, in twenty twenty one. I did a, a March Madness preview for the Today Show, and I picked Illinois to win the national title. Thank you. And then the uh, Loyola game happened. So <laughs> I don't think you want to know what I think of the chances. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, Faith, who is our Brandt Fellow for Public Engagement this semester, Faith Lee's got a question. Um, I, I think the, the most rewarding, um, well, I said at the beginning, you know, the, the three and a half years I did in New Jersey, did in New Jersey, I feel like I was doing time or something. No, I, I, that's what the politicians do in New Jersey. Um, I love New Jersey and I love the time there. And, and what, what was so rewarding, um, I mean, it's true, I, I've, I've gotten, you know, I've met great people throughout my career. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here because of somebody I met in my, you know, career. So I've, I've, I've met great people throughout my career. I've had great experiences and interesting moments. And um, to be, you know, on the air during, you know, a presidential election or something, a, a moment of pretty big consequences are really, you know, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a rewarding thing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I st I, my mind goes back to the, to sort of starting out in New Jersey. Um, which was just a, such a that political world um, in these these little you know urban political machines throughout the state you know Newark Jersey City South Jersey Camden um, and getting to know these sort of re truly old school characters um, who kind of let me into their world a little bit um, when I was at a kind of impressionable stage in my career yeah. um, I, I I just I I, I find my, I I look back on that a lot I'm still in touch with a lot of those people I just had dinner with a bunch of them last week. And um, uh, it just, it's, it's, to me, it's long term I now see. I, I can see the perspective of time. I have 20 years to look back on this now. And I'm, I'm just so glad, in particular, that I had done that. Because yeah. uh, I just, I got so much out of it. Great. If you have a question, raise your hand. Faith has got a mic, and she will come around um, and try and get to some questions here in our final 10 minutes. Uh, oh, what's your name? Uh, Julia. Hi, Julia. Hi. Um, I was wondering, because you talk about developing this love for data journalism and analytics so early on, and now you've been doing it as a job for like 20 plus years. So 
how have you avoided burnout in your career and how do you maintain it as something that's still really exciting for you? Good question. Yeah, um, it, it, it's, I, I, um, I think what's interesting about this is it's, it's always changing, you know? And, and what's interesting is with every election, you're just adding a new set of numbers to the data set. And um, so, I mean, we just show you like the, the, the shift that's taken place among Hispanic and Asian American voters. Could also show you the shifts that have taken place among white college, white non-college educated voters. They're massive. Um, and you're, with every election, you're just seeing, you know, is, is this story continuing? Has this story reached its end? Is the new story starting? Mm -hmm. Every election answers questions that you have and poses new ones. Yeah. And there's never, it's almost like a, a soap opera. There's never, I mean, it's just, we're all kind of going forward. It's never yeah. gonna really end. Well, I mean, maybe it'll all end someday, but you know, it'll. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> but, um, but it's until then, um, you're always left with a bit of a cliffhanger at the end of an election. Uh, they're never, you know, it, it, you always know, um, even when you get a landslide or something, um, it, look, it, it, in my career I've seen um, George W. Bush get reelected in 2004, and we were told that this was ushering in uh, 40 years of Republican you know, rule, long-term, permanent Republican majority. Um, and two years later, um, his approval rating was 30%. I saw Barack Obama win the closest thing to a real landslide that we've mm -hmm. seen in, in, in a generation now, in 2008, um, he won Indiana. Um, <laughs> and then two years later, I saw his party lose 63 seats. So it's just, it's always, if it was always the same election after election, yeah. it'd be easier to get bored, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Hi, I'm uh, David Mengel. I had a question about uh, divides that you see um, Considering the shift sort of in, in uh, political position of the Republican Party sort of over time, we're seeing this shift from a, a policy that's sort of uh, looking towards voters that are more well-educated towards those non-college voters. But I was wondering about the shift, uh, the, the difference in opinion, because I think you might have in knowledge about this that a lot of people don't, between uh, Republican voters, especially in really rural areas versus like small towns versus exurbs versus suburbs. And what that divide means, especially in like a Republican primary, where it's not just you know generic Republican versus Demo generic Democrat, but there are Republicans with conflicting, even if they have similar policy views, conflicting views of how the world works, you know, and, and what that means for policy. Thank you. Well, yeah, and I, and I think that gets to that's related to what I was talking about with that college divide, where you're much more likely in the in the rural areas to find. Um, within the Republican coalition to find voters without college degrees. As opposed to, you know, if you're in like the collar counties of Chicago, um, you're much more likely to find, um, or at least at one point were, much more likely to find Republican voters with college degrees. And um, you, you're seeing that um, I, it's stark in the, in, it's, it's always been stark in polling on Trump. I mean, we saw that in, in 2016 when he won the nomination. He did much better in rural areas. He did much better with Republican primary voters without a college degree than he did with you know college degree. That was a huge divide within the Republican uh, primary, and it's an even bigger divide in general elections. I always the, the example that I always tell people is like, you just look at Pennsylvania. Um, Biden won Pennsylvania in 2020 by you know about two points. Uh, the margin in 1988, okay, go way back in time. George H. W. Bush, the Republican won Pennsylvania over Michael Dukakis, a Democrat, by two and a half points. It was not, not a huge difference, right? Now, take a look at a map of the counties in Pennsylvania and how they voted in 1988 and how they voted in 2020. In 1988, all of the suburban counties right outside of Philadelphia voted Republican. They voted for Bush by massive margins. In all of blue collar Southwest Pennsylvania, voted for Michael Dukakis by overwhelming margins. Then look at 2020, all of the suburban counties now Democratic by double digit margins in the rural Southwest, uh, ancestrally Democratic, Trump 40, 50, 60 points. Overall, the state hasn't shifted that much, but 
two parties have completely, almost completely changed coalitions within that state. And we've seen that, and see, you see some of that in Illinois. I mean, you see that across the country. Massive, massive change on that education divide. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sally Greenberg. Um, you are highly skilled at using data in your journalism. And I just am curious, you know, you started tonight by telling us that you know, you went to film school at BU. <laughs> and so is the, are the analytics yours? Um, are, you know, how are you processing data and, um, you know, where does it come from? Did you study math in school? Did you, you know, grow up, like you said, baseball statistics? Yeah, just curious about more, if you could say more about your use sure. of data. Yeah, no, I've, I've always, um, I, I I've always enjoyed, I've been, I'm good with numbers. Um, I always say I'm very good with computational math. I'm terrible at, like, um, when I got into trigonometry and calculus, I remember we had my high school teacher, I feel so bad, I got into this, I don't know how, they put me in the uh, AP um, calculus class, and they take the AP test at the end of the year, and one to five is the score, and one's the worst, and five's the best, and she says, I've been doing, I've been teaching 25 years. I have never had a student get a one on the AP calculus <laughs> test. Then she got me, and I got a one. So um, I can add and subtract and multiply and divide very quickly on the fly, and I, I like using numbers just as a way of understanding any given situation. To get, put a number on this and, and have a, a source of comparison and to, to be able to quantify things and, and use numbers that way. Um, I've always had an interest in that. I always, you know, I said when I was a kid, um, I used to run outside, get to the Boston Globe, old days, it was on our doorstep, and you open it right up. In the summer, page four of the sports section was the baseball, and you get the, the box score of every game from the day before, and the standings, and I, I, you know. Um, so I've always had an interest in numbers that way, and um, I think that kind of naturally bled over to, to politics. And you really let the numbers speak for themselves. You don't come to this with any opinion. I, I, my credibility would be gone. Yeah. You know, if, if, if anybody is watching me on election night and thinks that I'm shading it, I mean, you ultimately can't. It's going gonna, it's gonna to land where they're going to count all the votes eventually. Yeah. And you're going to know who won, you're going to know who lost. And so if, if, if you're up there and, you know, you're letting it show that you're pulling for one side and not the other and you're trying to give, I mean, who, who wants to watch that? You know, it's, ultimately, I think it's, 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 a, it's an island in a very polarized media universe where, I really do feel that the stuff that I do, um, I could do in front of a blue audience, I could do in front of a red audience, because I think it's the one piece of common ground everyone wants to know who's winning and why. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Yes, my name is Deva Shao from Bloomington. I just wanted to know if you knew this. Her shirt says <laughs> she's in a relationship with Steve Kornacki <laughs> and his big board. And the big board, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Spent hours together. But, but my one mystery to me has always been about the polling. I, most people I know don't want to even answer the phone during election time, so where do you get the numbers? Yeah. And exit polling, do people walk up to somebody after they voted and say, how did you vote? Yeah. So. Well, so it's, it, uh, there's two different questions there. The, the exit polling, which I'm showing you here, if is- If you want to get up and be more comfortable, you Oh, can. yeah, it's, I'm actually enjoying this seat. <laughs> um, <laughs> the exit polling is, like notoriously, you know, kind of imprecise, and um, there are other studies after every election, midterm, Pew, Pew Research Center, does a comprehensive study. We don't have the results yet, but we will soon, that will, I think, supplant the exit polls. So if I was giving this presentation six months from now, and I was trying to explain the 2022 election, I wouldn't be showing you exit poll stats. I think they, they paint a pretty good rough picture of what's going on, but for a real precision look at it, you need, the, you need, what they do is they take a study of, you know, the, it, it dwarfs the number of people included in the exit poll. They're validated voters. They're people that the, the Pew knows voted in the election. And then they, they survey them and they get a huge sample size. And then I think you're really able to, to get a, a precise look at, at the demographic breakdowns and shifts in the election. So that's still to come. I think the exit polls are, are a rough, it, I just always take them with a bit of a grain of salt. But I think they do, in the case of 2022, I think they paint a pretty broad but clear picture uh, of what happened. In terms of polling, um, it, it's, this, is, this is the question everybody's dealing with right now in media. Um, we've, we have seen a bunch of different 
variations now in the last few elections. So in 2016, the polls clearly overstated or understated Trump's support, overstated Clinton's support, particularly in key states, or just missed it. Not sure what happened. Happened again in 2020 that way. It happened to some degree in 2018, even in the midterms in 2018, though not as dramatic. Um, and then in 2022, and, and what, what was happening was, so not to be all over, all over the place here, but say 10 years ago, let's say, and I was starting out doing this sort of thing, the standard would be that a very uncontroversial thing to say in any media organization would be, um, well, we have gold standard polls. We have polls that media organizations sponsor, that academic institutions execute, that have long track records, and these are the polls that we just know to rely on their numbers. And meanwhile, you've got this, 10 years ago, you would have had a growing number of new partisan pollsters, Republican aligned, Democratic aligned. They're now doing their own polls, and those are, we look at those suspiciously. You used to be able to say something like, oh, this is a such and such poll, we can rely on that poll. Right, or this is a poll. such and such poll, garbage, yes. throw it out. And the stuff that we used to call garbage nailed it in 2020, let's say. Um, the stuff that we used to call the gold standard, it was one of our competitors, a major outlet, had a poll of Wisconsin um, in October 2020 that had Joe Biden ahead by 17 points. He won by 20,000 votes. Um, it looked all night like Trump was going to win Wisconsin. Um, that's not a, that's a, that's a, that's the kind of miss the garbage polling you're supposed to deliver. So in the run up to 2022, a, a couple things happened. One is a lot of media organizations stepped back from poll. There was a lot less polling in 2022 that media organizations and traditional gold standard pollsters were doing, I think because they don't know what to make of all you know, the issue of response rate, the, all sorts of issues that could be responsible for this. We could do a whole other discussion on that. And into that void stepped more than ever partisan pollsters in 2022. And you did have this phenomenon of, of the Republican aligned pollsters that were painting a, a more friendly picture than what actually happened on election day. Now you had a lot of folks, a lot of Democrats, a lot of folks on the left saying it's irresponsible to be um, showing these polls, to be including them in your averages, um, and you have those folks now saying, given what happened on election day, anybody who did was a fool. Well, I, I, I'm somebody who did include them in the averages, and I did put them out there, and I'll defend it even, even though they were wrong this time. But they were right the time before, and they were right in 2016. And we were wrong. We've been wrong in, in recent times. There's, there's a lot of issues in, in, in polling right now. There's a lot of questions about polling right now. And you could say that the, 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 the partisan folks got lucky in 2020, but I, I, I don't have a great, I, I don't, I can't sit here and say, here's the five gold standard polls, these are the ones that are always right, here's the stuff you can ignore. Because the gold standard polls have been wrong too often in recent elections. And they might have been a lot more right in 2022, but that doesn't erase what's happened in other elections. And so, um, I, I, you know, I, I think if you want to take a lesson about um, taking all polling with a grain of salt and, and maybe changing our, our overall attitude towards polling, I, I'm, I'm open to that. Um, but I don't necessarily look at 2022 and just say, oh, we now we know which pollsters we can and can't rely on. I, I, don't, I don't take that lesson from it. So. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming and logging online and to Rich and Leslie Frank for making this all possible. And most importantly, to Steve Kornacki for making the trip here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night.